Welcome back, everyone. As always, I'm Michael LeBlanc, uh, and this is Mike on Money. Today, we are joined with Raj Lala. Raj is the uh, president and CEO of Evolve ETF. They have over $7 billion assets. Uh, Raj has been featured in different uh, different um, publications, such as CNN Money, Yahoo Finance, McLean's Global Mail, Reuters, Toronto Star, Investment, Ex Investment Executive, Motley Fool, and Advisors Edge, and he's graced us by coming on to our little uh, our little video today to uh, help us talk about a specific ETF or a strategy of ETFs called Covered Call Strategies or Enhanced Income. Um, the one we're going to be focusing on today is uh, ticker symbol bank, the, uh, the Evolve Canadian Bank and Life uh, Co. Enhanced Yield Index. You'll hear me in this video refer to it as bank because that's a lot to say all at once. Um, but... Uh, but Raj, before we jump into uh, bank specifically, uh, this key strategy that you guys, you know, have really taken taken the lead in, in the sector on, uh, can be applied to a lot of different uh, a lot of different sectors. Maybe you can just give us an overview of the different sectors that you uh, that you work with, and uh, and then we'll we'll revert back down to the core uh, strategy of bank itself. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Mike. Always a pleasure. Um, our covered call lineup, you mentioned uh, earlier that we're running about $7 billion in assets. We have over a billion dollars in our covered call strategies. Uh, bank, uh, the one that we're going to be talking about today, obviously, has uh, definitely been our most popular, one of our most popular. What we've tended to do uh, in general with our covered call approaches is uh, take a sector-by-sector -sector approach and invest in some of the largest companies in those sectors and then layer in an active covered call strategy to help enhance the overall tax efficient income uh, for investors. So we do that within the global healthcare industry. So the ticker for that one is life. Uh, that's actually our largest covered call fund. We do it for US banks. We do it for materials and mining. Uh, so we do it for a lot of different sectors. The one um, area that we just opened up about six months ago uh, was very unique in the sense that we have applied a covered call strategy to a fixed income portfolio. And for, you know, for your, for your clients and, and listeners, uh, they may or may not know that the options market does not exist on bonds. You cannot, you cannot buy or sell options on uh, individual bonds or traditional fixed income. However, you can do that on uh, ETFs. And so what we do is we use one of the largest uh, 20 year US Treasury ETFs, which is TLT, and uh, we write calls on uh, that fund. So, what we're doing is we're giving you the yield that you're receiving from the bond portfolio, but we're also giving you some option premiums uh, from the covered call writing that we do. And what we're finding right now, and I'm sure you have found that as well, the fixed income market has been super challenging uh, the last few years. And what we're seeing at the moment is in, in anticipation of rate cuts, we obviously just had one in Canada yesterday, and there's probably going to be rate cuts sometime in the next six to 12 months uh, in the United States. A lot of investors, a lot of advisors have decided they want to extend out their duration of their fixed income portfolios and, uh, and take advantage of the opportunity uh, of that. So that's why this 20 year US Treasury fund bond is the ticker. Uh, has become quite popular this year as well. That was fantastic. I, uh, you know, and I think I think this uh, this particular strategy or, or the, you know taking advantage of these these products in your portfolio today, especially for Canadians. I mean, Canadians have always historically just been uh, yield hungry, right? They've always been chasing yield, uh, and there's a lot of areas that uh, you know many times investors have gotten themselves uh, in trouble with taking on too much risk to get that yield. Uh, you know, the, one of the reasons I really like the obviously the the, the bank strategy focusing on the Canadian banks, which traditionally been a very good sector, and of course uh, some life uh, life insurance companies again very large stable firms or long track record firms. Um, let's talk a little bit about you know how you take that yield up. Like bank today, I was looking at it this morning. Uh, its current yield is sitting uh, just north of sixteen percent. Uh, which is fantastic. And I know it's trailing 12 month is north of the 16% mark uh, with this cover call strategy. Maybe give us a brief overview of what that, that cover call strategy is and how it works. So cover calls uh, are really there to give you some tax efficient income and to also cushion 
some of your downside risk associated with whatever you are writing calls on. So I view covered call strategies as somewhat a conservative approach uh, to investing in a specific area of the market. And so what a covered call option is, is basically it's a trading strategy that offers limited return for limited risk. And the reason why it's called covered call is because you can only write these calls on stocks that you actually own, hence uh, it's covered. So maybe the easiest way to kind of explain it is probably through a numeric example. Let's say you own a stock and it's currently trading at $100 and you have the option to write a call on that stock, uh, let's say a 104 call, which means that at $104, it becomes uh, in the, it goes into the money. If the stock is flat, let's say it only goes from 100 to 101, then you did well because you got some of the upside uh, and you also got an option premium attached to it. Let's say the stock went from 100 to 99. You also did better than just holding the stock on its own because you got an option premium to offset that 1% loss. So where are you worse off in a covered call strategy? You are worse off when the stock rockets or when it really rallies. So in that same example, if that stock went to from 100 to 110, you would have been called at 104. So you would have missed that differential between the 104 and 110. So you are giving up some potential upside in order to get that option premium, but you're also cushioning some of the downside because through that option premium, if the stock dropped by 10%, you would not be down 10% because that option premium would have offset some of those losses. So that's why I say that covered call strategies are uh, really strong, really helpful uh, to help insulate from some of the losses. You're still going to have the losses if it goes from 100 to 90, let's say, but you're not going to have as, as many losses. And because option premiums are taxed on capital account, it's a very tax efficient way uh, to generate yield. And as you and I both know, Canadians, as you said before, are always hungry for more yield. And that's one of the reasons why covered call strategies in the overall ETF market have flourished as much as they have over the last few years. Right. Well, now, you know, you, you brought up a good point there when you were talking about, um, you know, the upside, you know, so if the stock goes up to 110 and it shoots up, you know, you could possibly be called out. And, the, and so I'd like you to kind of address a little bit that side of it, uh, because you guys take a, a, a different approach, or I, I think, a more unique approach compared to a lot of your, you know, the other cover call strategy ETFs out there that tend to use a systematic, like almost an algorithmic approach to the cover calls. You guys use a very active approach. Maybe you can just touch on, you know, how that differentiate differentiates bank itself and, 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 you know, how that enhances the, the portfolio. Yeah, that's a great question. So there are a lot of the ETF providers that take a, a systematic approach to writing calls and, let me, let me explain what that means. It's kind of self-explanatory, but I just want to make sure it's clear. Systematic means you're just effectively writing calls. Let's say you have, you're have you writing on 33% of the overall portfolio. You're just simply writing on 33% of every single stock in that portfolio. So it's a purely mechanical strategy. And then you're rolling, usually on a monthly basis. Again, 33. you're not putting in any discretion as to whether maybe some stocks you want to have a little higher calls, maybe other stocks you want to have a little lower. You don't have any of that with a systematic approach. There's no discretion that actually puts, goes into it. It's almost like a robot uh, executing that strategy. What we do is an active covered call strategy. And what that means is that we are going to take a look at many, many factors. We're going to take a look at the market momentum. We're going to take a look at um, volatility. We're going to take a look at whether the options are actually being fairly priced in the market. And we're going to dial up and we're going to dial down our, uh, our calls on specific portfolios. By doing that, in our case, we have on average added about 2% alpha per year compared to a systematic approach. So the active approach for us has definitely uh, been working. A, a large part of that goes to the options team that we, that we have. Uh, at Evolve, they've done a, a fabulous job. But I really do believe that an active approach to it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, one of our funds, the, the healthcare fund that I mentioned, 
When COVID kicked in in, in in 2020, as we all remember, the initial reaction was the markets just dropped significantly. But when we started to see that the markets were rallying back, what we decided to do was really dial down our calls. Because remember what I said before, which is that when stocks rally, you're limiting uh, the amount of upside that you're going to get. We didn't want to limit the upside potential for the investors. So instead of having 33% uh, covered, we went down to like three, four, five percent covered. So in effect, you ended up participating in almost the entire rally when we had that recovery in uh, in Q2 of uh, 2020. So that's kind of the way we run the strategy. We think it's really important to take an active approach to it, and I think our numbers have translated into the proof of that. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, the, I think uh, anyone looking at uh, and at any of the charts, the track records on bank, they'll uh, they'll definitely see that. The, uh, the other thing I think, you know, maybe we can touch on a little bit is uh, the current macro environment, because that active strategy thing is going to come into a very big, um, you know, forefront here uh, and, and play out as we go into perhaps, uh, the, the, you know, further cuts in the interest rates, which especially in, you know, bank or, or even in bond situation is going to pay a, a big part in the in the returns of those those companies, which have largely been stagnant or down over the last uh, year because of the rise in rate market. Uh, so maybe touch on where you feel the macro is, uh, specifically talking about the Canadian financial sector. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question because um, there are two sides to the macro environment that the banks uh, participate in. Uh, you can see how they could benefit from different uh, macro events. And I would say interest rates are probably the best uh, way to look at them. Normally what you would expect is that when you have rising interest rates, what ends up happening for the banks is they increase their interest margin between what they are paying out to investors, as in, as in people that are making deposits, and what they're earning, as in what they're charging on a mortgage or, or a loan, that delta grows. Therefore, their revenue should grow as well. But the downside of that, potentially, is when you have rates as high as we've had over the last, that have grown over the last couple of years, is that you have higher risk of defaults. And then the banks need to account for some loan loss provisions uh, in their books as well. And so that, so there's a positive and then there's the negative side of rising interest rates. The negative, the, sorry, and then the other side of it is what happens when uh, rates decrease, like we just experienced yesterday, and I think most people are expecting we're going to continue uh, to, to experience. Well, what that's going to mean is um, you are going to get more people now taking out mortgages because they've been waiting for better rates you are going to most likely have less defaults from uh, borrowers. And at the end of the day, um, you don't have to account for potentially as much loan loss provisions in your books. So that can be a positive too. So where I kind of go with all of this as it relates to the banks is I've taken a very simple philosophy in my life, which is I will never bet against them. because <laughs> They always <laughs> win. They always find, the banks always find a way to win, whether you believe in the oligopolistic business model or you don't. The Canadian banks are incredibly strong. We just saw many of their earnings last week. They continue uh, to hit new records in many cases. I almost say like betting against Canadian banks is like betting against big tech. I wouldn't do either of it. I would <laughs> want to hold them for uh, the longer term. Right. That's that's fantastic, yeah, and I do, uh, you know, I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. The, uh, you know, I think Canadian banks have to be, especially for Canadian investors, should be a staple in the portfolios. And, uh, you know, I, I think that really really mitigates the cover call strategy. You know, like you said, that upside risk. If you're going to hold anyway, you know, get that enhanced yield. Uh, any, but you know, any small uh, missed opportunities on a, on a small piece of that portfolio over time will be, uh, you know, drowned out by the enhanced yield that you're getting uh, out of the portfolio. Um, so with that, you know, just to kind of wrap things up for everyone, uh, if we could just touch a little bit on risk, I mean, 
um i just finished the video that we're going to be launching out so if someone wants to go uh you know find that on our on our channel here uh talking about liquid uh liquid alts uh and the private debt sector and and how most people don't understand the liquidity risk and rate risk that they're facing in those types of products uh and a lot of them ran there because of 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 yield right they just looked at those attractive numbers and we won't even dive into what return of capital is versus versus yield yeah. but uh you know looking at bank as an alternative for people who are looking for that kind of cash flow from their investments uh, maybe talk a, uh, a little bit more of how you see how it's how you see that fit in their portfolio uh, from a risk perspective so uh, bank is uh, categorized as an alt. And the reason it's categorized as an alt is because it does have leverage. Uh, so there's 25% leverage in this portfolio. Now, people have different views of leverage. Um, it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, it can be your best friend as, as rates or as returns are going up or performance is going up. And it can compound your losses as performance is going down in the underlying portfolio. Um, but needless to say, we decided to put leverage in this portfolio because we liked the fact that the, the we liked the relationship between rising interest rates and potentially decreasing interest rates with a portfolio of banks and life goes. So we felt that um, even if costs go up of leverage, you know, some of that would be offset by the potential growth of revenue for those banks or for the life goes. We didn't talk about the life goes. We talked about the banks. But, you know, when you have rising rates. What, 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 what ends up happening is the life goes and end up investing all those premiums that we're all paying into interest bearing uh, uh, investments. So as rates go up, they generate more revenue off of uh, those premium uh, investments. So that we, we really liked the relationship between leverage, but yes, of course, the, the risk of leverage always is, the, is, is when things don't work in terms of when the portfolio decreases in value, it's just going to ultimately uh, compound. Having said that, it's 25% leverage. It's not 100% leverage uh, in a portfolio <laughs> like this. So it's fairly modest, uh, but so far so good. It's been working really well for investors. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, you know, despite being in the alt category, you know, the I think the other big differentiator for for the ETF bank, of course, is uh, daily liquidity uh, in the in the open market. Uh, so, you know, if investors uh, situation change, they can get out. And even on the fund version, uh, it's daily liquidity, uh, you know, as well. Right. Um, and the underlying portfolio, of course, is very liquid for you. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the risk of ever being uh, cut off redemptions would be, you know, next to nil, I would think, given the underlying portfolios. Well, yeah, very, different, very different to have a prospectus versus an offering memorandum. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, with that, Raj, I've taken up a lot of your time. I really appreciate you being with us here today. Um, if anyone has any questions, they want to talk about bank, any of the other leverage strategies, uh, feel free to reach out to us. You can, uh, you'll find our contact below. You can go to mikeonmoney.com. Uh, happy to answer any questions about your current portfolio uh, or anything, uh, anything about what we talked about today or any of those other strategies from Evolve. So uh, thank you very much, Raj. Uh, have a great day, and I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Thanks, Mike.